Well before it hit theaters, Madame Web had people talking. You have to give it that. Does the full film manage to escape its meme-inspiring pre-release buzz? Only one way to find out. Warning, spoilers ahead. Madame Web focuses on Cassandra Cassie Webb, a New York City paramedic. Cassie's mom died giving birth to her while researching the healing powers of a rare spider in the Peruvian Amazon. You've probably at least heard about that part. He was in the Amazon with my mom when she was researching spiders right before she died. Cassie isn't too good with people. Having spent her adolescence in the foster care system, she can't even properly respond to a grateful kid giving her a picture after she saves his mom. Cassie has to quickly work through those personal shortcomings after she nearly drowns to death, gaining the ability to see the future in the process. This puts three young women, Julia Cornwall, Matty Franklin, and Anya Corazon on Cassie's radar after she has a vision of them being killed by Ezekiel Sim. He's that man who was in the Amazon on with Cassie's mom when she was researching spiders right before she died. Cassie gets framed for kidnapping the trio of teenagers, so she tries to stay off the grid and protect Julia, Matty, and Anya while also coming to terms with her past, developing a bond with these three young women as well as learning details about her mom's life help Cassie realize she can do so much more with her superpowers than she previously imagined. This character growth and new relationships all come to a head in the movie's final act, which sees Cassie Julia, Matty, and Anya trying to outrun Ezekiel. Cassie figures out that Ezekiel killed her mother 30 years earlier to gain possession of the rare Amazon spider and its powers. On a quick third act trip to Peru, Cassie also learns that Venom from the same species saved her life when she was born. The leader of a native tribe of spider people explains that the spider's bite also provided her with her powers, which lay dormant until her near-death experience. From there, things play out just about like you'd expect a modern-day superhero movie climax to, complete with Cassie remembering key events from her past as she channels the optimal version of her superpowers. After Cassie returns from Peru, she and her cohorts find salvation in a building full of explosives that they can use to fight back against Sims. Thanks to the four women using flares to kickstart these explosives, this volatile location eventually goes kaboom as Ezekiel makes one last desperate bid to take Cassie and the teenage girls down. But once Ezekiel is defeated by the power of teamwork, the warehouse goes down in flames. After that, there's an epilogue in which Julia, Matty, and Anya visit Cassie in her new apartment, giving viewers a chance to see what Cassie looks like now, as she was blinded and paralyzed during the climactic fight. Yes, by the end of Madam Web, Cassie is blind and in a wheelchair. Comic fans will certainly recognize that Dakota Johnson's version of Cassandra Webb has become considerably more similar to the comic book version of Madam Web but with some drastic differences. Johnson is much younger than Madam Web in the comics, for one, and the movie iteration of her character isn't tied to a life support system. But by the end of the movie, she's clearly more in line with the Madame Web fans have seen in comics and cartoons. It's not the how you must master, it's the why. Cassie gets even closer to the comics version of Madame Web with a flash forward vision into the future, in which she has donned a bright red spandex outfit while Julie, Matty, and Anya are also wearing their respective superhero outfits. Confining Cassie's exaggerated attire to just three final shots is a bit of a peculiar move. Given that Madame Web is already a pretty obscure character, it's doubtful that just seeing Dakota Johnson in a red outfit at the very end will register with most people. Still, while probably confounding to newcomers, that element of the Madame Web ending does tie into what Cassie could look like in future movies. Several seemingly critical plot points in Madame Web never get resolved. Julia's father issues, what happened to the spider Ezekiel kept in his apartment, and Cassie being a wanted fugitive, to name a few. Another character detail that also gets totally overlooked in the finale is the fate of Amaria, a technology expert who functions as Ezekiel's right-hand woman. It's quote-unquote woman in the chair. She helps Ezekiel track down his three teenage targets throughout the film, even after initially expressing hesitation about hurting people who are so young. If you left Madame Web thinking you blinked and missed some kind of resolution to Amaria's inner conflict, you didn't. 
and Mario just vanishes from the movie altogether, with the character never getting referenced once in the home stretch of the film. Ezekiel doesn't even communicate with her through an earpiece for technological assistance when he's trying to wipe out his target, and Mario's initial hesitancy to help Ezekiel would lead one to believe there might be a redemption arc for the character during the explosive ending. But nothing like that emerges. Perhaps one was in there and it got cut out. Cassie's best work pal is a friendly fellow by the name of Ben Parker. You have a winning personality. I guess I got yours by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> He's very excited that his sister-in-law, Mary Parker, is pregnant. The names of those characters will make the ears of anyone familiar with Spider-Man's origin per cup while watching Madame Web. Given that Ben is Peter Parker's uncle and Mary is his mother in the comics, Mary also mentions that the future web slinger's father, Richard Parker, is out of the country. The playful teases about what this lady will ultimately name her baby are supposed to subtly hint at the idea that audiences are watching a stealth Spider Man prequel. Interestingly, though, the audience never hears anyone refer to Mary's son as Peter, even after he's born. The closing scenes of Madame Web feature Mary clutching her baby close to Ben sitting next to her, but the two never call the child by any name. Recent reports have suggested that reshoots for Madame Web removed explicit connections to any of the recent Spider-Man movies. Dialing back on confirming that Mary's kid is Peter Parker may be part of Sony's plan to let Madame Web play out as a standalone enterprise rather than have its ending get overwhelmed in Spider-Man's setup. However, such a plan does feel at odds with a movie where the villain wears a Spider-Man-like costume and Uncle Ben is a character. First appearing in the world of Marvel Comics in 2001, Ezekiel Sims has become a recurring foe of Spider-Man and his associates in various comic storylines. Though he's not an especially well-known character in terms of appearances in non-comics media, Ezekiel is still enough of a presence in comic books to make him seem like a reasonable candidate for recurring baddie status in future movies. The ending of Madame Web makes it unlikely, though, that Ezekiel will be back for further adventures in the Madame Web or Venom franchises, since he ends up dying. Even after all that work decades ago to prevent his demise, Ezekiel meets his end in 2003 by way of falling from a great height and then getting crushed by a crumbling letter from a neon Pepsi Cola sign. Granted, multiversal shenanigans could ensure that variations on Ezekiel Sims come back in the near future to torment other Spider Universe characters. After all, there technically already was another version of Ezekiel that made a cameo in Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. For now though, the ending of Madame Web sends a message that this notable comic book foe seems to be a one and done in the live-action realm. Morbius only featured a pair of offhand references to the Venom movies, but his mid credit scene did feature Spider-Man homecoming baddie Vulture. I'm not sure how I got here. Has to do with Spider-Man, I think. Neither of the Venom movies sees the impending arrival of Morbius or Kraven the Hunter, but Venom 2 referenced the MCU's Spider-Man. Madame Web takes its cue from those titles and also largely being a standalone enterprise, though that was inevitable. Madame Web takes place in 2003, years before the events of Venom and Morbius. Let's try that again. The closest connection to other Sony Spider-Man Universe titles is simply through small background details, like the Daily Bugle newspaper. Those little nods come before the finale, which focuses squarely on the new Madame Web characters. The aforementioned removal and explicit name drop for Mary Parker's son allows the Madame Web ending to play things surprisingly standalone. Studios like to keep big plot twists and sequel teasers under wraps, so the cast and crew of Madame Web haven't said much about the film's ending yet. Director S.J. Clarkson, however, did tell ComicBook.com that the ending sets Cassie and her cohorts up so that they can go anywhere. Because of that great plethora and wealth of character in the comics. And Dakota Johnson, who plays Cassie, referenced the finale in an interview with Entertainment Weekly, but only offered her behind-the-scenes perspective on the production. I've never really done a movie where you are on a blue screen, and there's fake explosions going off and someone's going, EXPLOSION! and you act like there's an explosion. That, to me, was absolutely psychotic. I don't understand what's happening. Even though Madame Web is meant to be a largely standalone affair, 
You don't need clairvoyance to see how it could easily impact future installments of Sony's Spider-Man universe, especially when it comes to the ending. While the movie takes place in 2003, the final scene sees Cassie witnessing a vision of the future in which she, Julia, Matty, and Anya are all costumed crime fighters. It's easy to imagine a time jump taking place that allows them to become full-fledged superheroes and lets them rub shoulders with the likes of Venom and Kraven the Hunter. Meanwhile, the implied birth of Peter Parker at the end of Madame Web gives the film an easy way to connect to potential Spider-Man entries, although connecting to the MCU Spidey specifically could be difficult. After all, Venom, Let There Be Carnage, and Spider-Man No Way Home confirm that Tom Holland's wall crawler exists in a different universe from Venom. It's also worth remembering that comic book and animated TV versions of Madame Web eventually become powerful enough to cause ripple effects across multiple universes. That power could, if translates it to the world of movies, see Dakota Johnson's Cassandra Webb finding her way into the animated Spider-Verse titles. The Madame Webb ending suggests that this movie is the tip of the iceberg when it comes to Cassie's powers. For nearly two decades now, audiences have been conditioned to stick around through the credits of Marvel movies for scenes teasing future sequels and adventures. The Marvel Cinematic Universe popularized these mid- and post-credit scenes in movies like Iron Man and The Avengers, but they've existed in Marvel adaptations even before the MCU launched like in X-Men The Last Stand. Sony's Spider-Man-less Spider-Man universe has kept this tradition alive with major mid credit scenes in both Venom movies and Morbius, teasing the places where these darker anti-heroes could go next. Naturally, we expect plenty of moviegoers to sit patiently through the credits of Madame Web for some kind of teaser, like a hint of a crossover with Venom or Kraven the Hunter. If after all this you still want to go see Madame Web in theaters, We'll save you a few minutes, there's nothing there. There's no Morbius cameo in the middle of the credits, and those scenes showing the spider women eating shawarma once all the names of crew members have gone by. There's not even anything teasing viewers for holding in their pee to the very end. You're still here. It's over. Go home. Madam Web simply ends where most movies do. But that makes it a true anomaly as far as Marvel movies are concerned. 